Welcome back everybody. 1113 fuel injection pump assembly starts now. Everything has been cleaned, inspected, replaced where needed. New gaskets have been made, including these infernal little tiny ones up there. We might get into that later. But parts and pieces are all over the bench, so let's start the decluttering process. So to begin the assembly today, I'm going to start by dropping the new lifters and return springs into the bores. I've got assembly lube in the bores and on the guides. The uh, rollers are all oiled up in the bottom and then uh, adequate coating of assembly lube also on the lifter and the spring. And just like in the disassembly process, we will cage them up against return spring pressure. Now it's time to install the camshaft, and yes, this is 1113's original cam. Uh, that scoring I thought I saw in here, polished right out with some fine emery paper, and honestly, I checked this thing and compared it to the other camshaft that I had, put it in the housing here, set some lifters in, used a dial indicator, I checked uh, lobe lift, I checked duration, Everything between this cam and my other one matches. I can't detect anywhere in this at all. If you look closely, you can still see all the machining marks in the lobes. It was not even worn enough to uh, erase those. So honestly, I'm going with 1113's original cam. It's amazing how tough these things are. Never even changed the thrust plate off the end. The fold over lock is good. The bolts are good. No wear on that at all. We'll just grease this up and put it in. Good fit. Back right side up once again. Now we can remove the cage bolts and set those lifters back down onto the cam. Now we can put the lifter yokes and the troughs on and I've pre-installed number one so you can see kind of how the trough is positioned. It actually has its uh, drip opening towards the rear back there. Purpose of this trough and I believe the parts manual calls it a shield, service manual calls it a trough. Um, either way it does the same thing. It catches drippage from the barrel and the plunger that is up above this lifter yoke and basically directs it off and to the rear of the housing back here. If you look back behind number two lifter right off the end of the pick, there's that hole back there. That hole is basically a channel that goes down the back side of the pump and exits out the base. It does not go down to the lower oil reservoir. It actually feeds that angle fitting right there that's on the bottom cover. Once it goes out that angle fitting, it goes onto a drain and just exits out on the outside of the engine. Now the most difficult part of installing these yokes and troughs is positioning the small little gasket seal that has to be on the tops of these lifters right around that, that very shallow channel. You can see I've got a couple back here. Very, very difficult to make. Um, when you get anything that thin, it's really hard to get those popped out. Now, if I was smart, I would have just uh, found the part number in the manual here, called up the dealer and see if those were still available. I did end up making those. Luckily, I had two different sized hole punches that just barely worked out, but uh, they barely mention them at all in the parts manual here. The service manual doesn't make any mention of those. 
and I'm not really sure how critical they are, but I got them in place anyway. So you see here, here's the lifter yoke, there's the trough, or this manual is going to call that a shield. Right below that is a little cutaway right off the end of the pick, barely even legible, even off camera. Follow the arrow over, that's the 2A5614 shield. That is the trough, as the manual calls it. And right below that, 2A5710 gasket. So 2A5710 is the cat number for that. I don't even know if it's available. Like I said, I didn't even check. I just decided to make them because honestly, I kind of forgot about those little things anyway. Um, might be worth checking to see if they're still available. So with the gasket in place and carefully trying to keep it in place, we'll just uh, set the trough in there and then start the yoke. And I put just a little bit of assembly grease on the threads because we are going steel into aluminum so you know it just kind of helps to keep everything from sticking use that same screwdriver with the end of it wrapped in electrical tape for protection and we don't need to worry about the lifter height here yet because that has to be set once this is on the engine so looks like the gasket is still in place below the trough what I'll do is just cinch that jam nut down if anything just to keep that gasket in place and hopefully it decides to uh, take a set onto the top of that lifter so that if I have to disturb this trough again it should just want to stay where it's where it's at stay put and a repeat for the rest So that's what they should look like when they're all assembled. You can see all the troughs are pointed toward the back. You can see the drain hole back there where the excess uh, fuel will run off should there be any leakage down from those barrels and plungers. There's usually not much of anything at all. One other thing I want to point out when you assemble these, make sure that the drip edges on the troughs aren't pointing right at one another because they can get hung up on each other. If you uh, if you don't have those positioned correctly so next I'll put the rack rod spring stop on I made a new fold over lock for that to replace the old one didn't even check the part number that was just uh, easy enough to pop out so we'll get that new lock positioned under the bolts start by putting the back piece on first because that's kind of a tight fit on the dowel make sure that seats in well the rest can just go in on top of it So the last time I did a fold over lock installation, I didn't even show it and a couple people in the comment section let me know about it. They felt a little bit slighted that they didn't get to see the fold over lock action. So here we are front and center. You can watch it play out right before your very eyes. So we'll get a nice 90 degree bend on that one. Liking that. And look at that, it'll even give you a second angle. Catch the other one. Highlight of the video right here, I can tell. Get it all nice and tight up against the flap of that bolt. And we'll just cinch it in here a little bit. There, I like it. I'll put the rack rod back in now with a light coating of grease. Now we can lock it down with the adjusting nut, lock and jam nut. And if you remember from disassembly, not only did I measure how far the adjustment nut was onto the rod, I marked the slot that the lock was in and we counted the turns that it took to get that off of there. Everything was uh, documented right there a lot easier than trying to remember so using that same process I'll get this put back in position so by utilizing my marks and measurements I have recreated 1113's prior fuel rack setting bear in mind now we never heard 1113 run and we don't know for sure that its prior setting was accurate it's just what it was set up to be when we got it um, I don't have any reason to believe it wasn't accurate and I don't see any hammer or chisel marks in here like anybody's been messing around. 
Sounds like I'm being sarcastic, but 5J2115, that's all I'm gonna say. So to verify this, we're gonna use the Caterpillar 3H1690 fuel rack setting gauge. Right here, you can see the 3H1690 in the lid. I mean, anything that comes in its own custom-made dovetailed wooden box just has to be awesome, right? So this is what it looks like right here. And to use it, it attaches to the top of the injection pump housing. It can go in the place of any one of the individual fuel pumps. Uh, the base end of it is constructed just like a pump plunger. It's got a similar toothed quadrant with a timing mark that will align with a corresponding mark on the straight toothed rack. And it just lets you measure rack travel up to the full fuel wide open travel position. Uh, pretty simple, really. So I'm going to have to put the toothed rack back in, even if it's just temporary for this check. Then the gauge goes in place of one of the pumps. Like I said, it can go in any one of the spots. It doesn't matter. Now we have to make sure that our timing mark on the gauge is lined up with the timing mark on the bar. You look down through that hole down there and see. Yep, we are good. The gauge is locked down using the existing fuel pump hardware and you're ready to measure. So. We have a zero mark here and a zero mark there. The reason there's two of them is because it allows you to account for counterclockwise and clockwise rotation, depending on which engine you have this gauge on. And I know GoPros aren't great for this uh, fine detail stuff, but you can see we've got graduations around the outer ring. Um, starting from the zero mark, those are basically, well, the long ones are tenths, the short ones are hundredths. And inside here on the dial, these are thousands. Those are in 5,000 increments, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and so on. So counting from the outside, starting at the zero mark, you would be 0 0.5 and then 1, 1 1.52, 2 2.53, so on and so forth. Basically, it's just a vernier scale. So we will reference the rack setting chart. Probably going to be hard to read, I apologize, but... Model D3400, and we have the 2A5718 injection pump cam, and we have different rack settings and corresponding horsepowers for different load ratings from 1200 RPM full load speed all the way up to 1600 RPM full load speed. And it basically gives you a maximum rated or continuous load spec and then your rack position according to those and then the brake horsepower that's developed from each one. So to do a static set or test, I should say, on this rack, we're gonna go to the 1500 RPM full load speed rack setting and the 1525 RPM, the special little italics right here, that is the sweet spot for the D3400. So what we want to look at is the max .460 rack setting. That's gonna give us the 32 brake horsepower that the D3400 is officially rated at. So to perform this check, proper procedure is to pull this fuel rack in until the base of the primary adjustment nut just contacts this spring stop right here. Now Caterpillar's official terminology for that is the torque spring. You're gonna learn why in just a second. So as we start pulling that rack in, we see the dial starts to move. And we bring that in just until it contacts the spring, but does not compress. So now we see what our reading is. We can see the zero mark has moved quite a ways over. So we have 0.1234, that's 0 0.450, and we're a little bit beyond that. So now we line up our thousandths graduations. We go 5, 10, 15 is just not quite, but 20 thousandths is pretty well lined up. So we have 0 0.450 plus another 20. We have 0 0.470 for an initial measurement. So with our goal of 0 0.460, we got 470. So we're basically um, overfueling by 10 thousandths. Now, can't really call it overfueling because Caterpillar was notorious for running all of these diesels in the 30s, 40s, even into the 50s a little bit in a slightly detuned state. Um, needless to say, they can take a lot more than what factory settings or original factory calibration dictated, but longevity was a primary selling factor with the Caterpillars and just detuning them a little bit helped things live a lot longer. But with that being said, I went ahead 
you can see my paint mark no longer lines up with the lock. I advance this one slot. So what that's going to do, it's not going to let that rack open up quite as far. And we're basically just, we took a little bit of fuel out of it. So re the gauge. Let's do the same procedure. We'll just see where we're at with this one slot worth of change just till we contact the spring. And we look over here, we are one, two, three, four. We are at 0 0.450 right on. So 450, basically what that did, we are running minus 10. So that actually derated us a little bit more. So I'm thinking the, uh, original setting was from the factory um our perfect target's going to be right in between these two lock slots i'm going to put it back where it was it's going to open it up a little bit my personal rule of thumb when you're dealing with these engines running in an already detuned state at proper calibration if you're going to hit right between slots always give them a little more don't take any further away so I've returned the adjustment back to the initial setting, and now we're going to talk about the torque spring. Uh, where that comes into play is if the engine encounters a load that is so severe that the RPM just starts dropping, 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 it's going to get to the point where the flyweights behind the front cover are not going to be doing much at all to try and pull that fuel rack closed. So basically, governor springs on this other end, and it's in full control. So just visualize, it's got both its feet braced against the housing, both hands are on that rod, and it's just trying to pull that thing open for all it's worth. Legend actually has it that if it weren't for the sound of the engine, you could hear that thing back there yelling, broken arrow, broken arrow. Anyway, at that point, the governor spring is exerting sufficient enough force on that rod on the rack to just compress that torque spring flat to the face of the housing. And you're in war emergency power mode at this point. It is throwing every bit of fuel that it possibly can at the enemy, and it's just trying to recover and trying to get that RPM back. So basically, that torque spring is your one last chance not to have to use a starting engine again. So we're going to look at the low end of our rack setting chart here. We're going to go down to the 1200 RPM full load speed setting, maximum 0 0.540. This is last ditch effort time right here. So if we compress that torque spring flat to the face of the housing, we look at our gauge, we're at 0 0.550 right on. So that makes sense. We are also 10 thousandths to the plus of what our basically desired max target is. So pretty confident that we have everything at proper setting. Everything's been locked down fully tight. It's going to stay. I could do these checks before I took everything apart, but I prefer to wait till the end because, you know, this way everything's locked down. It's not coming back apart again, and I don't have any opportunity to misread my notes, misassemble something. Everything should be uh, set right where it needs to be. So at this point, I can take the gauge off. We'll take this uh, straight toothed rack back out, and we'll proceed. Back upside down again, now that we know that everything's happy up top, we can put the base cover on. Get this portion of it sealed up. Okay everybody, that's gonna about do it for this video. I know I got a little bit involved making sure that our rack adjustment was right, but now we know that it is, so. Uh, really nothing else can go back in until we get those lifter yokes set. We're going to need to keep this front part open to access with the tools so we can't put the straight toothed rack in. We can't put the front cover on. We're going to have to be taking measurements down from the top so we can't put the fuel pumps on. Uh, and this thing needs to be on the engine to do that anyway. And we can't put it on the engine until we get something back here that's going to retain this fuel passage plug and also give us a thrust surface for our cam. Both of those things are accomplished through the governor housing. So governor's Coming up next, we're going to get this thing apart, make sure it's all right, repair as needed, and get that put on there. And then we'll think about getting this put on the engine. And we still can't do lifter settings until, until we put a flywheel on for the timing mark. So uh, what can I say? The to-do list just never gets any shorter. Um, oh, one other thing. Comment section has been seeing these pre-combustion chambers back here. Those are not out of the cylinder head. Those are the spares from 1113's cracked head. Those other ones are still stuck. So that's going to save me a lot of typing right there. Like five people have asked that question. 
Thank you for watching, everybody. We're going to keep on rolling ahead. Governor's next. Please tune in again. Oh, all right. Make the really small gasket to go in that tiny little groove up there. Why didn't I just see if the dealer still had that? Oh my gosh. All right. So, 16th thick sheet cork, just a small scrap piece, and hole punch with two of the sizes, one right above the other. Oh, uh, this is going to be fun. These are difficult. Really easy to make things go off the rails, but whenever I need to work myself into doing something, I just channel my inner walk and you need to make the seal without its disaster, it's rods flying insanity. It's just crazy, crazy unknown. So we have the blank we just popped out, changed down to the smallest size. Let's try and center it up. Make sure it looks even all the way around. This is a tough one because you can blast this thing right apart if you're not careful. It's so thin. Let's tap it. No more than necessary. Carefully peel it off. All right. I have a very thin little gasket there. So, we'll do a test fit. And the trouble is, that hole punch stretches it a little bit. So now it's a little too big. So now we just resize it, kind of like the Teflon seals and the transmissions at work. So I'll just put the yoke with the trough on top of it. Start that in a little ways. Now we'll run that gem nut down just until the yoke starts putting a little bit of pressure on that gasket. Okay, we're pretty good all the way around here except for you can see some of it sticking out right off the end of my finger there. So I'll just take this small screwdriver and we'll just push that stuff in. Check all the way around, it's looking pretty good. Make sure it all gets into the groove. Cinch that jam nut down. There, seated all the way. That can just sit in there for a couple hours. It'll shrink back down and uh, take on the shape of the top of that lifter. Still say I should have just tried to buy them. <laughs>